Now you see these, or you hear, we heard these sort of pseudo democratic phrases coming out of Trudeau. I would, I say that because he's saying we will always stand for the right to protest. We will always stand for, um, you know, diversity of thought and things like that. But then we see what happened with the emergency act being invoked. And so my question is, if this is justified in this situation, and we know that it was a peaceful protest, even at Trudeau, he said, you know, there were people with extreme ideologies that may have acted, not that they did act, that they may have acted. So my question is, what could have been done differently? If this many people, and, and Alan, I'm directing this question to you, maybe you can answer from a legal pr perspective, but if this many people come together after months and months of, um, you know, not being happy with mandates from the government, and they come and they go to parliament and they get there and their intention is to protest until they're heard or or until the mandates drop, what exactly could they have done differently? Um, or anybody gone in the future, what could people do differently so that this uh, emergency act isn't enacted? Well, that's a really good question, Drea. And what can people do differently in a, in a protest of that size, yeah, almost impossible for anyone to really control something like that, right? Because you know, and let's let's just be like honest about this protest. It was unprecedented, right? And it was unprecedented mm -hmm. because there was so much dissatisfaction out there about uh, what the federal government was doing and what provincial and municipal governments were doing, right? But I I don't think anybody will be able to control a group that's that big and that diverse and even that diffuse, right? Because it's all over the country. Now, as for um, not uh, doing something to prevent the invocation of the Emergencies Act, that's yeah. somewhat out of our hands, isn't it? Right. Because th those decisions are made uh, behind closed doors um, yeah. by the government and their advisors in cabinet meetings and in these IRG meetings. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think we can do anything about that except uh, except vote for better politicians who mm -hmm. won't invoke these these acts which are, are potentially abusive. Alexa, if, were if you I at all add, surprised? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, if I can add something, it's just uh, during the whole process of the public uh, order the public uh, order emergency commission um we receive like you know the evidence and the documents sometime the the same day and it was always like throwing like some information so people had like some difficulty to keep up and like to be sure that all the information get out of this whole commission but today it was about the same like um we received first of all in a two hours lock up in a room with a document about two of 2000 page in two hours to review and to get the information out. I have again the impression that they would not want that we get the bottom out of all the information that been saved in that report, because in a month from now, when we will like probably pass through and digest this whole like document, uh, people have will have passed to something else and just forget about right. the this commission since since they have like the verdict. So again, I just have the impression that this commission is just like in fact um, something to justify his act, but not really being there for giving the full information clear right. to the public. Right. Yeah. It's impossible for you to go through 2000 pages and then be able to convey uh, the meat and potatoes of what was written in the ruling. Can you tell us something you did come across in the time that uh, you've been able to look at the documents that people should know about? Um, but first of all, they were talking about disinformation and misinformation. And they actually say the, the news media have contributed to it. And they gave the example of the arson uh, you know, the fire that they were supposed to be related to protesters of the convoy, but that that finally the police came out and saying that they have no no link with the, the protesters. So that was one of the false information that was uh, spread in media. Also, they were uh, talking about um, 
uh, they, they talk a lot about the disinformation and misinformation about COVID-19. Uh, they did the talk a lot and repeatedly, like they say it about, and that probably did create uh, uh, more pressure and more people involved in this movement. Um, mm-hmm. I I was like, okay, it's depend of what you're talking about, disinformation and misinformation. We can mm-hmm. be more clear at yeah. this this level. Um, who who is spreading the the misinformation in in that right. level? Um, According to whom? They <laughs> exactly, and uh, they also talk a lot about the miscommunication between all the law enforcement, the government, and institution too. Uh, we know that they had a lack of um, of communication. It's why uh, most of their recommendation is. Um, is giving to improve that communication between the, the different like a, institution and police. They also talk about uh, some of the member from group that were uh, that joined the movement that was not mm-hmm. really related to it, but they joined right. as uh, the, yes. the 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 far Fada from Quebec, but and also Pat King and right. and uh, Romana. That actually, unfortunately, yeah. painted badly the whole movement. Same if they are not with all, like they don't represent all the protesters. So some part, I am actually in totally disagree, as he said that he doesn't believe at all the Hendon report on what they say about the violence that was present. The Hendon uh, report say that they were not, not the... Uh, um, no violence and no uh, n- nothing to report on illegal um, right. action and he say I disagree w- with the violence because he heard some testimony now about having violence in the convoy so um, mm-hmm. it's his own interpretation we will say and I have the impression that uh, he's talking really a side when on when when we really look at all the the recommendation in his opinion on on the whole report mm-hmm. now alan did you get a chance to look at the recommendations that were made um for the next time or even possible revisions to the act and what did you think of them Thanks for asking. I haven't had a lot of time to read over the Act, but I did go through the recommendations briefly, and the one recommendation that really stuck out for me was that um, the Commissioner suggested that the the reference to threats to the security of Canada uh, should be removed from the definition of a public order emergency. Hmm. And I think the effect of that yeah. is that it makes the the, a public order emergency a little bit easier to invoke. Right? Yeah. And so that's something that I would actually respectfully disagree with the commissioner about. I think that's an important part of the Emergencies Act. Uh, it's an important part of the definition of a public order emergency. And maybe we can uh, beef it up a little bit. Maybe we can clarify it a little bit. But I don't think we should get rid of it entirely. Because that's really what was most contentious at the public order emergency inquiry. Right? It was this debate over right. whether or not there were um, threats to the security of Canada, specifically in, in terms of threats of, of, of violence, of a serious violence to, to persons or property. Mm-hmm. You know, you're right. And it would make it way more easier. I mean, the bar would be ve- quite low after that. Alexa, did you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, uh, because I read all the recommendation myself. And uh, I just say, yes, uh, this is true. The they try to make the um, the emergencies act more more available, more more uh, easy to use. But also, I didn't really like the recommendation uh, fifty three that actually talk about the government to fight against disinformation and misinformation on social media, right? And to and to to try to to stop. Uh, all this like in propaganda on online so that just give me more um more power to the government to put more law in place to control all all what we sign online 
Mm -hmm. And to circle back with uh, Prime Minister, and I know um, you guys might not have seen this yet, um, but he says that he would have rephrased the small fringe minority and that really that language was sort of meant to just a small amount of people within the group who had been spreading misinformation and disinformation. And he even said uh, are linked to more deaths. So he's he's accusing uh, this sort of cabal of the trucker movement as as killing people. Um, and uh, on the flip side of that, he's saying that all these people that came together are just dumb idiots that follow, follow those people's misinformation. What do you make of that? Um, Go, Alexa, my I know part, you're burning to answer it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, I, I saw that also in the report. And uh, what they say in the report, they say, and that is Rulo saying that, they say, I expect that the prime minister was intending to refer to a small number of people who were expressing raci- racist, extremist, or otherwise reprehensible views rather than to all Freedom Convoy participants. I'm sorry, but I always say it. It was like the small fringe minority who are going, who are, who are on their way to Ottawa, who are holding unacceptable views. Mm. Uh, it was not about right races or stuff like that. It no. was about the fact that people were at like another line of thinking about the decision making by the government from the last two years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Alan, I'm going to ask you a question. Sheila asked me, um, she basically, you know, neither of us were surprised about the findings. So my first question is, were you surprised? But um, is there a time during this, the whole commission where you thought this is the result we were going to end up with? Is there anything that made you think that way? Well, no, I'm, I'm not surprised by the findings, right? Um, and I don't think there was any point in time when I thought, oh, that's it. Um, the commissioner is going to rule in this way. I always sort of suspected that this would be the case. And part of the reason for this, um, Drea, is because the, the, the terms are not very precise, right? And this mm-hmm. actually comes out in the report a bit. When you look at um, the, the words, uh, you know, threat and violence and serious, uh, they're, they're somewhat open-ended. They're not really e- exactly defined, right? And mm-hmm. some people, you know, have even gone on to, gone so far as to say that these are, are definitions which are capable of extension, right? So to me, I have a, a, a pretty, uh, like I, I, I have a, a sort of a, an idea in my head what a, a threat of serious violence is. And I don't think um, we, we heard any evidence of anything like that in the six weeks of public hearings. But there are a whole lot of little things that we heard about. And it's no surprise to me that all those little things have sort of cumulatively added up to um, to what we what was really, I think, essentially missing from the evidence. Mm-hmm. That's what we saw today. Now, Alexa, how about yourself? Were you surprised at any point in time <laughs> with what happened? I was actually panicking with the 2000 page. I was like, I just want to know, like, if it was justified or not, where he's writing on it. And I was just like passing the page and just looking for it. And when I saw it, I was not really surprised. It's it's really what I was expecting from. But now my question remains, we know that some MP went out to, to talk about the verdict and as the NDP who actually say that is a failure of the multiple level of policing. So do they will ask for an election since, since the NDP will, will do a lot of different in the balance. So Mm. this is what I need to see. Do we will have an election or not? Right. Yeah. There was, um, uh, the statement that it was a failure of federalism. And yeah. So what do you make of that statement, uh, Alan? The statement that the, 
if that, it's that one of the concerns. The finding in the Public Order Emergency Act was a failure of federalism? Is, is well, that uh, that, the finding was that it was justified, but he said that there were concerns that there was a failure of federalism within that. Well, I, I, haven't, I haven't arrived at that part of the report if it's in the yeah, report. Yeah, this is all right off the cuff. But do you find, do you believe there was a failure of federalism, um, you know, working with the other provinces that were involved in this? Well, there's, a, you, know, you know, there's a duty to consult with the other provinces. And I haven't read what the commissioner said about that yet, but it seems to me that um, whatever happened there, if what happened counts as consultation, it wasn't really meaningful consultation, right? Um, you know, these these provincial ministers were gathered on the morning of uh, the the day when when uh, Justin Trudeau decided to invoke the Emergencies Act. He, they some of them expressed concerns. They had no mm -hmm. warning, really, right? Um, no formal warning, at least. And it, it, is that a a breakdown in in federalism? I I wouldn't go so far to say that. You know, I'd say that it's it's just an example of the act not working out like it was supposed to work out. But I think, you know, generally federalism is a, a good thing for people who don't like um, who, who who don't like tyranny, right? Um, because it it divides powers between different governments, right? So one person or one government is not in charge of everything. Um, and, and that's one of the traditional justifications for federalism. I think that's still in place. It's not a federalism problem. It's a problem with politicians. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that were asked in the question and answer period time was whether or not Prime Minister Trudeau believed he owed an apology um, to some of the people that got caught up in the bank seizures. So not necessarily for everyone mm -hmm. who had their bank account seized, but some, maybe it was a joint account with a spouse or something like that. He made no apology, kind of danced around it and said, you know, we might learn things in the future. But, but what, what is your guys, your opinions on um, no apology to basically the people who couldn't even pay their bills, some of them? Yeah, well, I think, you know, number one, he, he should apologize to to people who had their accounts frozen. Even if he was justified in doing that, there should have been some way for these people to get their accounts unfrozen. Right. right? It should have been. Yeah. And, and for people who, who were completely innocent, um, and, and I think you're referring to those people when you say people had, who, who held joint bank accounts who, with somebody mm -hmm. who might have been at the protest area, there should have been some recourse for them, Right. Yeah. I think going back to a question that you asked earlier, though, about the fringe minority, if mm -hmm. Trudeau is saying now that he should have said that differently, maybe he owes an apology to a lot of people that he's alienated uh, mm -hmm. with that remark and with other remarks that he's made uh, throughout the past several months. Right. And he said, I wish I would have worded it differently, but still no apology. So, yeah. Mm -mm. That's a clip from something we call Rebel News Daily. It's our daily live stream hosted by my friend David Menzies, but the show also includes a rotating cast of hosts and special guests, including me. It's a great way for us to talk about the news of the day as the news is happening in an unscripted fashion, and it's an awesome way for you to interact with us as well. We stream every weekday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Mountain, wherever you find Rebel News. See you there.